transgenderism and gender identity have entered the news again as LGBT ideology continues to dominate American public life. Close to us here in the nation's capital, two Virginia public school students filed a complaint yesterday alleging the state's model policies for transgender students violate local and federal law, and they accused officials of ignoring evidence-based best practices and discrimination. Meanwhile, schools in blue states are taking actions to enforce conformity on LGBT issues and crushing dissent. From The Federalist, Massachusetts public school administrators forced a middle schooler to remove a shirt acknowledging there are only two human sexes. The middle schooler, Leah Morrison's shirt, caused no disruptions at the school, according to the complaint. The incident prompted Morrison to wear a different shirt to school that read, there are censored genders, which administrators also forced him to remove, the lawsuit says. The pushback against dissent from LGBT ideology comes as new research into procedures and treatments specifically prescribed to children come under increased scrutiny, though gender activists wish it was not so. In a recent piece from Unheard, British clinical neuropsychologist Sally Baxendale writes that political activists attempted to stymie her research report into the effects of puberty blockers on children, noting that one reviewer for her scientific article, quote, argued that lots of things needed to be sorted out before a clear case for the riskiness of puberty blockers could be made, even circumstantially. Indeed, they appear to be advocating for a default position of assuming medical treatments are safe until proven otherwise. Here to discuss how transgenderism and LGBT ideology is impacting the political landscape and children is Sarah Partial Perry, Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Sarah, welcome to Rising, and I know we uh, hit you with a lot of stories there, but I want to distill this a little bit down into a recent move from the Biden administration to finalize their new Title IX rule, which would include gender identity and sexual orientation as a protected category under Title IX. And uh, in effect, what this would mean is that girls' spaces would be abolished in public schools um, because you would have to allow a man or a boy who identifies as a girl to have access to locker rooms, sport teams, bathrooms, et cetera. So if you could start by just walking us through the implications of this Title IX change and where or when, rather, we should expect to see this coming down the pipeline. Yeah, it's hard to underestimate uh, exactly how sort of catastrophic these changes are going to be. Remember, Title IX has been around for 50 years. It's never been interpreted to mean anything other than male and female, as this term sex is used within that law. And it was really the pinnacle achievement of the women's liberation movement. It was sort of the feminist dream that women would have all educational opportunities that were tantamount and equal to those of men, graduate schools, sports, scholarship programs. This change is going to open up every separated arena that has essentially essentially been created to protect the interests of women and to prevent discrimination and essentially open it up to any natal male who identifies as a woman, whether or not that is going to result in discrimination, violation of privacy or lost championship titles, scholarship opportunities or more. This is going to be a rule that will have devastating effects for American education and will affect every school in the country that receives so much as a dollar of federal funding, whether directly or indirectly. It is currently under review at the White House. They have 60 days to be able to make it through and can ask for an extension up to 120 days. After that point, it goes back to the Department of Education to make any necessary changes. And if it makes it that far, it will be published in the Federal Register once it has survived the timeline for a Congressional Review Act challenge. That means that both Senate and House chambers on Capitol Hill have two thirds of a vote requirement to be able to downvote it and essentially defeat it before it's ever published. But for the most part, we anticipate that this rule will affect every school receiving federal funding in the country by August or September of this year. Now I wanna to turn to the middle schooler wearing the two genders t-shirt. There was of course the landmark Supreme Court case in 1969, Tinker v. Des Moines, when you had students wearing their armbands to show their dissent from the US involvement in the Vietnam War. And you had a 7-2 ruling from the Supreme Court where they said it turns out you know, students don't shed their constitutional right to freedom of expression at the schoolhouse gate 
But then we saw in 2021, two students, eight years old and five years old, wearing Black Lives Matter shirts, and they were pulled from, from classrooms and not allowed to reenter their classrooms for the entirety of the day. Why do you think maybe the Supreme Court should hear this case or, or rather than the case about the Black Lives Matter shirts? It sounds like at this point, we're not going to see anything come of that, given that that was in 2021. Why do you think the Supreme Court would or should hear the case on the gender shirt instead? You know, this is about as close to a fact pattern in Tinker versus Des Moines as you could possibly see. And we do know a couple of things about the rights of students and their free speech uh, property and sort of intellectual property rights once they go into the public school system. They do not shed them at the schoolhouse gate. And the Supreme Court made very clear back in the 1970s with that decision that ultimately children can represent whatever perspectives that they would like so long as not disruptive and that is the key when it comes to public information public expression public speech and remember these are federally funded schools they are for all intents and purposes limited public forums they are government entities so the children have to respect certain time place and manner restrictions and especially within education the goal is to make sure that there is nothing disruptive about the speech that's offered here liam was not disrupting anything with a t-shirt that said very simply there are two genders and in fact there have been t-shirts that have represented other political and ideological perspectives already at that school yet Liam was singled out for different treatment. Well, that's viewpoint discrimination and that's patently unconstitutional. This is currently right now in federal trial court in Massachusetts. Any honest judge worth their salt who passed the bar exam will be able to see that this is an unconstitutional restriction on his free speech rights. And the goal is that this may not have to make it to the Supreme Court because the federal trial court will ultimately do the right thing. Sorry, I just want to make sure I understand you clearly. Is it that the eight and five year old Herbert boys in the BLM t-shirts, those were disruptive, but Liam's gender shirt was not disruptive in your view? Those are the claims of the attorneys, yes, on both sides. And in fact, depending on whether or not there was an actual disruption whatsoever, the boys with the two Black Lives Matter t-shirts have a right to express their perspectives on that as well, so long as not disruptive. That is the criteria that any federal court will determine whether or not any speech, whether nonverbal speech, expressive speech, or verbal speech is considered to be disruptive in a classroom. If there are circumstances flowing from that that could make an American classroom somehow lose discipline, good order, or prove to be disruptive, then the school administration has a foundational basis to be able to ask those students to remove their shirts. But in Liam's case, distinctly, we know there was not any disruption whatsoever. So we've seen some polling uh, recently come out on the issue related to puberty blockers and hormone therapy for youth who are suffering from gender dysphoria. And it finds that most people are opposed to offering this type of medical intervention and support instead the wait and see method of seeing how these uh, children progress when they reach adulthood. Now, uh, despite this public opinion being so strongly against this, we've seen that a lot of uh, transgender activists as well as mainstream media outlets have been uh, really pushing back against the idea of banning these treatments through legislation. However, over the past year, we've also seen in the UK that their medical establishment has moved away from puberty blockers and hormone therapy. And in the past year in the United States, media outlets have started publishing more skeptical uh, opinions on this issue. The New York Times just uh, published a huge investigation from Pamela Paul about the existence of detransitioners and the percentage, the high percentage of children who desist from uh, gender dysphoria. Do you feel like perhaps the tide is turning a little bit in terms of the public opinion um, starting to turn the tide on the media coverage and perhaps some of the um, activist support of the way that we treat transgender kids in our country. I hope so. That is my great hope. And all the polling that we've seen really across the spectrum, whether it's from Harvard Harris, Washington Post, or Rasmussen Reports, all indicates that about 70% of Americans approve of a wait and see methodology. Most of the developed Western nations, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, to a certain extent, France, and England have all now 
backtracked on their previous sort of fast tracking, affirm only, affirm often type approach because they realize there is a paucity of evidence that indicates these really are completely safe treatments whatsoever. And in the absence of that evidence, we really need to take a wait and see approach. We know that anywhere between 80 and 94% of these teens who have expressions of gender incongruity or gender dysphoria go on to ultimately make, make peace with their birth sex. Listen, puberty is a very tormented, hormonally charged time period. I am the mother of three teenage kids. They don't always make the best decisions. These particular state bans are exactly what the states should be doing. Those state legislators are making sure that the interests of vulnerable kids who may not even be protected by their own parents because the parents too have been fed a line about the fact that this is life saving care. They are doing exactly the right thing and making sure that legislation protecting the interests of these vulnerable kids is passed, signed into law, and ultimately can protect them until they are old enough to make these decisions on their own. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us, Sarah Partial Perry. We'll have to have you back to break, break this down more. Woo. Thanks so much for having me.